Welcome to MOTV, where we cover recent legal developments affecting the construction industry in Queensland. I'm Hannah Sadach and I have with me today Joanne Manning, who is a Chartered Civil Engineer and is both Arab's Australasian Resource and Waste Management Business Leader and leads the circular economy agenda for her firm. Welcome to the show, jo Joanne. Thanks, Hannah. Um, today we will be discussing the importance of creating a circular economy for the Australian construction industry. Could you ex please explain why this is an important issue? As we know, the world is becoming increasingly urbanised and we have finite resources and a significant amount of carbon either released or expended extracting these resources or locked up in these resources. On top of that, we have our ever increasing population and consumption demand is resulting in more and more waste being generated, which needs to be managed in a safe way for both our human health and our planet. Now imagine a world where essentially we didn't have waste and the excesses and residuals from our activities become intrinsic to the cycles of human existence rather than a byproduct. For this to happen, waste worldwide needs to be reused, recycled and reformed, but most importantly, it needs to be valued within our modern world. So what role does construction play in all of this? Well, we recognise the construction industry is the largest consumer of resources in the world, both directly and indirectly. And these resources are both finite and have a significant amount of embedded carbon. Also, the construction industry is one of the largest generators of waste in Australia, with over one third of all core waste generated being from construction and demolition. We also don't think it's only the responsibility of those actually constructing the physical building assets to manage. But in reality, construction includes the whole life cycle, from planning and designing to the operation of the facility, and very importantly, the maintenance and deconstruction. Each actor along the life cycle is both contributing to the outcome and has a part to play. In a circular economy, we recognise the interconnection between these stages and consider how resources and materials are both valued and can be enabled to be valued at every stage while also limiting or avoiding negative externalities such as waste and carbon. So has the circular economy been embraced in the construction industry? No, not really. The construction industry is lagging and is mainly still a linear model. For example, typically about 10 to 15% of all building materials are wasted during construction and this percentage is normally higher on one-off or small bills. Once constructed, waste is apparent in the usage of air energy, for instance. Currently, about 20 to 40 percent of energy in existing buildings can be profitably conserved. Australia on a whole is quite good at recycling construction and demolition waste. The latest National Waste Report cites a recycling rate of approximately 75 percent, but often at a much lower value than was originally used for. Other countries are far better. In Europe and Singapore, for instance, the reuse and recycling rates are approaching 100%. This, though, requires a real mindset change on how we handle, manage and process construction and demolition waste both on-site and in waste facilities. The current linear model makes us highly dependent on limited resources. Globally, we are currently only recovering about 10% of all the resources we are extracting. The vast majority of resources are being emitted as pollution. The current trajectory of operating within a linear economy is not sustainable. Currently, 70% of the world's population is affected by rising inequalities and 33% of the world's land is severely degraded. There needs to be a greater awareness that the construction industry is a chief contributor. So how do we move towards a circular economy? When we make this shift through a systemic approach. First, we must design out waste and pollution in the initial stages. Next, we must try and keep products and materials in use as for as long as possible. And finally, we must aim to regenerate our natural systems that have degraded from the construction process. This can be looked at by considering both the biological and technical cycles. Another way to think about the circular economy is to think about the decoupling of the increase of human well-being and economic activity, which we have strived for and underpins the 20th century, from resource use and environmental impact which we are now realising could derail the 21st century. These are some great points. What would you say to those who argue that the current linear economy allows for positive economic growth? Well, the current linear economy has resulted in the unprecedented growth over the last two centuries. However, the growth has to be finite because resources are finite. The circular economy paradigm offers this opportunity and being an economic model importantly offers economic benefits. 
It has been calculated that the circular model is likely to have a huge economic benefit. If the shift is made, Australia's economy is predicted to gain close to $24 billion of additional economic value by 2030. While in Europe, the total benefits by 2030 are likely to be close to 2 trillion euros. So how does Arup plan to make the shift? Arup clearly recognises that if we do not embrace a sustainable future, we will not have a future. We have recently revised our global strategy and we have sustainable development at the heart of our framework for action. Our strategy for sustainable development has six key principles. The adoption of a circular economy, which is framed around the decoupling of economic growth with consumption, are central to the framework. At Arup, we have recognised the importance and opportunity of considering circular economy principles at all stages of the project, and that starts with good design. So, when applying these principles into actual practice, how can a current construction process be assessed? Well, let's start by considering where value is lost and wasted. This begins by considering resource cycles. Most often when we do have resources, we don't use them for long enough or we use them excessively. This means that we have shortened life cycles on many assets that should be prolonged or we have redundant resources as part of our assets. We also need to consider utilisation rates. Are we providing a piece of infrastructure to address the need that may have disappeared in 10 years? Can we think differently or provide more flexibility to adapt to gain more use? And we need to at all times be thinking what happens at the end of its primary use. How can we keep these resources in use for as long as possible at their highest value? Such considerations indicate that the industry loses enormous value of resources throughout each stage. I see, and what's value lost is ascertained. What strategies can be implemented to embrace a circular economy? Well, we're seeing a shift away from end of pipe solutions, seeing a shift to adopting circular economy through the lens of a design strategy. Particularly in Australia, there's a heavy focus on circular design strategies. These designs are considerate of reducing resource consumption, utilizing recycled materials, digital twinning, reducing costs and increasing the life cycle of resources. So for instance, designing for deconstruction will be a good example of a design strategy. Interesting. Design strategy sounds like a promising method. It is. And when you apply this approach holistically and interconnect it across the project life cycle, it actually changes from becoming a design strategy to becoming a business strategy. This means that at Arup we are working with clients to focus on the value creation of a circular economy. We consider how to maintain the highest value of assets by considering the various forms this could take. This needs to be viewed as a systemic change rather than just addressing one part of the design strategy. Do you believe that the current regulatory framework encourages a circular economy? Unfortunately not. The current framework aligns with the linear economy. For example, builders often find it is easier to utilise existing non-recyclable materials as they already meet current regulatory and procurement requirements. And equally, specifications and standards are lagging too, which creates another barrier. This disincentivizes builders from utilising recyclable and new materials in the construction process. Regulators in Australia do not want to overgovern the construction industry, so they simply regulate what is currently being utilised in the industry. They are slow to take any lead, hindering prog progression into a circular economy. Yes, the law in Australia hasn't really caught up with this issue yet and is mainly focused on dangerous products such as asbestos and ACP. What other countries could we look to for inspiration in this space? So Australia is far behind many other nations and is also very fragmented in its approach across states and territories. A leader in this field is the Netherlands, where the government has taken proactive legislative measures that clearly promote the valuing of resources, support the regeneration cycle and seek to do more with less. They are also willing to show leadership and demonstrate through their own investments that the circular economy works. So in the Netherlands, they have built the first 3D printed bridge, which uses 70% less materials than a traditionally constructed bridge. They have built a new public building using an adjacent dilapidated building as a materials bank. And their urban farming practices are leading the way in regenerative sustainable methods. There is clearly a lot of work to be done to make a meaningful shift to a circular economy in Australia. However, Australia's commitment to spend $250 billion on infrastructure over the next four to five years is a huge opportunity to be first by being second. Thank you for talking with us today, Joanne. My pleasure. Well, that's it for today, but we look forward to seeing you next time on MOTV.